If you haven't become a Christian yet, I hope you'll listen closely because you may be at the point of saying, well, I, I believe in Jesus and I, I want to be a Christian. And when is that definitive moment of being a, a Christian? I spoke uh, this week with a young man. So I wish I could remember my conversion better. He, he gave his life to the Lord at 13. He was baptized at 16. And he wished he could remember more about that. God has given us a definitive moment when we become children of God by faith. And that is at baptism. And a lot of times we'll go to the book of Mark. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15, and 16. But people say, no, that, that, that is an addition to that gospel. And there's a lot of controversy that that may not be found in the Bible, which is consistent with other passages teaching the same thing. But I said, well, we'll go to the book of Acts. And we look at Acts and, and say, well, the, here's the examples of that. But a lot of times uh, uh, those are not affinity for enough people. But we have another place we can go to. That the epistles that were written to churches comprised of Christians and written to individual Christians, it also speaks about baptism. And I think having that in our understanding will help us a lot in referring back to the things that happened in the book of Acts and give you a complete understanding of that. Mark, you know, in Acts, we'll find people commanded to be baptized. You never find a command to be baptized in the epistles. Why? Because they've already been baptized. So what they did the inspired writers would reflect upon baptism that had already taken place for them becoming Christians, and it reveals some interesting things about it. In our passage in Ephesians 4 and verse 4, we read along with other things that we can be united in. There's one Lord, there's one faith. He said there is one baptism. And our mission this morning is to take the scriptures primarily from the epistles, and to examine them to find out what is that one baptism. Because I find a number of baptisms in the New Testament. Baptism unto Moses in 1 Corinthians 10. John's baptism. The baptism of the Holy Spirit. And yet Paul says here, there is one baptism. He didn't command anybody to be baptized here. He just reflected upon it by inspiration. So let's learn some things from that. And let's examine this. Let's we'll find out what it's not. And I want you to go to one passage and a uh, chapter in the book of Acts, which uh, is going to be a stepping stone of what we see here in, in Ephesians 4, 4. Well, what is this one baptism? Because it's one baptism, it can't be seven or eight. We're going to find out what it is. But here are two points from Acts 19 that I tell you that baptism, the one baptism is not this. Paul comes in to Ephesus, where we find, he finds some disciples. And we find, well, disciples of whom? We're going to find that they were disciples of John. And we pick up in verse 3, he said, into then what were you baptized? And they said, into John's baptism. What did Paul do? Well, that's the one baptism, it's okay. No. John baptized the baptism of repentance, saying to the people that they should believe on him that should come after him. But see, now Jesus has come, and now we have a new baptism. And he says, when they heard this, they were baptized into the name of the Lord Jesus. If baptism is baptism, it makes no difference. Of, well, you at least were baptized. Why would he tell them to be baptized in the name of the Lord? They've already been baptized into John's baptism. Because John's baptism is not the one baptism. Now we begin to say it's the baptism in the name of the Lord. We just go to the next verse and we'll see something that's to distinguish between Holy Spirit baptism and miraculous gifts. Because in Acts 19 and verse 6, we'll find that Paul laid his hands upon them after they were baptized in the name of the Lord. And they spake with tongues and they prophesied. They had miraculous gifts from the Holy Spirit given to them through the laying on of an apostle's hands. That tells me it's not Holy Spirit baptism. 
So why would you say that? Acts the 10th chapter in verses 44 through 48. We'll find that not only is it baptism in the name of the Lord that's the one baptism, but it's water baptism distinguished from Holy Spirit baptism. And let's notice this when the Gentiles were first brought into the kingdom as Gentiles because they believed the same gospel that was preached to the Jews in Acts 2. Now pick up the reading in verse 44. While Peter yet spake these words, the Holy Spirit fell on them that heard the word. And they all, uh, and they of the circumcision that believed were amazed. And as many came with Peter because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Spirit. Whose hands were laid upon these people that day? None. Holy Spirit came from heaven upon them. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. They confirmed that these people had these miraculous gifts. Then answer Peter, can any man forbid the water? That these should not be baptized to receive the Holy Spirit as well as we. And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus. There's baptism in the name of the Lord. And it's water baptism in the name of the Lord. And what you see here is that the spiritual gifts did not come to the laying on the apostles' hands, as we see in Acts 19 and verse 6. But we see this happening direct from heaven. That's exactly what happened in Acts 2. When the Holy Spirit came miraculously upon the apostles, gospel is preached and said, men and brethren, what shall we do? And they were told to be baptized, repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord. Acts 2 in the name of the Lord. It's the same baptism as Acts 10 in the name of Christ. And it's water baptism in Acts 10. It's water baptism in Acts 2. It's distinguished from Holy Spirit baptism because in Acts 2 and Acts 10, we'll find that's when Holy Spirit baptism came because in Acts 11 and verse 15, Peter says this. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit fell on them even as on us at the beginning. And I remember the word of the Lord, how he said, John indeed baptized with water, but ye shall be baptized in the Holy Spirit. If then God gave unto them the like gift as he did unto us, when we believed on the Lord Jesus, who was I that I should withstand God? That's why I commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. And when they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying to the Gentiles also have been granted repentance unto life. What did Acts 2.38? Repent and be baptized. These people were re re repented and were baptized in the name of the Lord. The element was water, not the Holy Spirit. So I know the one baptism that Paul speaks about here is indeed water baptism in the name of the Lord. Now, to further confirm that, Let's just go to the book of Ephesians again. Let's take it a chapter over. Ephesians, the fifth chapter, we see in the relationship of husbands and wives and the church, as, as Paul is comparing these two. He says in verse 26 of what Christ did for the church, that he might sanctify it, having cleansed it by the washing of water with the word. Now here's a washing a water. And Ephesians 4 and verse 4, there's one baptism. The next chapter over, so here is the washing of water by which people were sanctified. That tells me water baptism is also, from this viewpoint, from the epistles, the one baptism. It's in the name of the Lord, not in the name of John. The element was not the Holy Spirit, was water. Holy Spirit baptism is what people were baptized in as the Holy Spirit came directly upon them. And just to further confirm that, when Acts the 10th chapter, Peter is reminded, and everybody there reminded, that it fell on the Gentiles like it fell on us at the beginning. That's Acts 2. But did you know the Holy Spirit came upon people in Acts 8? And Peter had a part in that? Why did he say it came from the, as the beginning? Why would, why would Holy Spirit baptism, the Spirit comes upon them, and you lay hands, but it, it, it's a Holy Spirit baptism. It's not. Holy Spirit baptism is distinguished. It is the element in which they were immersed in. Miraculous gifts were the, were the, were, were the fruits of that. 
Well, miraculous gifts were the fruits of laying on of hands. But that wasn't Holy Spirit baptism. Peter says, as it came on us at the beginning, not in Acts 8. And yet Peter was a part of that. He knew the difference. We should also. So we can nail down as we study the epistles about baptism. That it's not John's baptism. It's not Holy Spirit baptism. It's not baptism into Moses under the old law. It's baptism in the name of the Lord. And the element is water. Now, let's proceed. Let's see how those things go together. As looking at it from the standpoint of the one who does the baptizing. Jesus says to the apostles before he was sent into heaven that they were to go out and make disciples, apostles, people, men, make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, that united Godhead, the authority of the Lord. And so Paul did that. He went out to the Corinthians in Acts 18 and verse 8, and he preached the gospel to people, and he personally baptized people. 1 Corinthians 1, Paul will say, I'm glad I didn't baptize a lot of people. Why? Because they think they're baptized into my name. See, they're supposed to be baptized in the name of the Lord. But he did baptize too. And he speaks about that. He is doing the baptizing. And it was men doing that in the name of the Lord. Now look at 1 Corinthians 12, 13, because here's another place we see baptism in the epistles. Explana explaining something that's important for us. First, the body is one and hath many members. So all these Christians have been baptized through the preaching of the, uh, from the gospel uh, message. All the members of one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For in one spirit were we all baptized into one body. Whether Jews or Greeks, whether bond or free, we're all made to drink of one spirit. See, most of the time people will say baptism and the epistles is Holy Spirit baptism. And here's the passage. But I want us to notice that he says that in one spirit were you all baptized into one body. What baptism of the Corinthians had they participated in? It was Paul preaching and Paul baptized some of them. Others baptized them. What does it mean then for in one spirit were we all baptized? Through the directions of the Spirit's teaching. Paul would bring them in touch with the gospel. He would personally baptize some of them. It's through the instrumentality of the baptizing of the men, baptizing men. And the element is not the spirit, it's water. And the spirit is the revelation that brings us to Christ. That's what Ephesians 5.26 says again. Washing of water with the what? Word, the Spirit inspired Word, is what we follow through the preaching of the gospel to realize it's water baptism that I need to obey. Isn't that what happened in Acts the eighth chapter? When the eunuch said, Here is water, what doth hinder me to be baptized? Where did he get that information? Acts 8 and verse 35, we find Philip preach Jesus. The inspired message, the word of God was preached to him. Therefore, he knew water. He knew that he must be baptized. The element is not the Holy Spirit. The element is water. The Spirit directed and revealed the revelation of how through baptism we can come to Christ. So it's water baptism in the name of the Lord. That Holy Spirit baptism, not John's baptism. Well, let's notice this design. In Romans the sixth chapter in verse three, an epistle of Paul to the saints in Rome, 
I know these people have been baptized because this is his point. But they needed to understand something from it. And they need to understand what was the design of baptism. And this is where I want to bring Paul in. Notice this word. Or are ye ignorant that all we who were baptized into Christ, does Paul include himself? He says we. Paul, were you baptized? Yeah. All we were baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death. I begin, I now can learn something. Here's the design of, of baptism. Why were you baptized, Paul? Acts 22, 16, arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. He said, that's how, that's the design of why I was baptized. That's the same baptism, Romans 6, 3. We all who were baptized into Christ were baptized into his death. So why? We can have our sins washed away. Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins. Appealing to the Lord. He's the foundation of it all. So I know it's design. I also know it's a form. It's a burial. For he says in verse 4, we were buried therefore with him through baptism into death. That like as Christ was raised from death through the glory of the Father, so we also might walk in newness of life. It is a burial. Why do we have to know that? Because there's so many people today that say you could be sprinkled for baptism. You need water poured upon you for baptism. Baptism, that's just a sacrament. You can do it any way you want to. The word means immersion. And what I learned from the epistles, he called it a burial. Not a sprinkling, not a pour. He called it a burial. It's an immersion. Even Holy Spirit, you're immersed in the power of the Holy Spirit. And Holy Spirit baptism. That's the element. But it's water baptism you're immersed in. But he calls it a burial in verse 4. Thirdly, it stands between the sinner and the newness of life. Now that's where a lot of religious people say, no way, but we're staying with the Bible and we're staying with the epistles. As it tells us some things about what is in baptism. Notice we're raised to walk in the newness of life in verse 4. We come to chapter 6, same chapter, verse 17. But thanks be to God that whereas you were servants of sin, ye became obedient from the heart to that form or mold of teaching whereunto ye were delivered, and being made free from sin, ye became servants of righteousness. I, I was once a servant of sin. I did something, and now I'm a servant of righteousness. Sin to righteousness? What did I do? You obeyed from the heart to that mold of teaching. How do you obey a mold? I can look at a mold. I can observe the mold. I can, I can cherish the mold. I, I can just, what a wonderful mold. How do you obey the mold? Remember, we were baptized into his death. And because he was raised, we're also raised from that burial. Like Christ was raised, we're also raised. That's the doctrine. And how do I obey the mold? I get, I'm baptized into his death. I'm baptized with him in his death. I'm baptized into his death, into death. And I'm, because of his resurrection, I'm raised like he was to new of life. That's how I obeyed that mold. I was a servant of sin. I had my sins washed away. Now I'm to be a servant of righteousness. Did you know baptism involves an operation? You say, oh, that's why I won't be baptized. I don't want to have an operation. Well, you'll realize that it's something God does. And you don't have to be put to sleep. In fact, you need to be wide awake. But it's an operation that takes place. I learned this from the epistles. In Colossians, the second chapter, in verse 11, he says, In whom, meaning in Christ, ye were circumcised with a circumcision not made with hands. That's the kind of operation it was. It's cutting away something. And no hands were involved. 
kind of a magical op operation. And putting off the body of the flesh in the circumcision of Christ. And having been buried with him in baptism, wherein you also were raised with him through faith in the working or the operation of God, who raised him from the dead, you being dead through your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, you, I say, do you make alive together with him, having forgiven us all our trespasses. We have faith in the operation of God. There was a circumcision take place. It wasn't of the flesh, but it was done without hands. But he's comparing circumcision that would be with hands, cutting away something. And he says, here was putting away our trespasses. And it was an operation done when we were baptized into his death. And through our faith that he was raised from the dead, we're also raised with him. As Romans 6 says, this newness of life. Why would somebody argue that you were saved from your trespasses before baptism? Why would I need an operation? If it already happened before baptism, why would I need to go through this operation? The operation takes place in baptism. And I was a servant of sin, but I repented of my sins, and I was baptized in water in the name of the Lord, having my sins washed away because of what Christ has done. Baptism stands between the sinner and the newness of life. If you're thinking, well, must I be baptized? To have my sins washed away? Yes. Where'd you learn that? I'm learning its meaning from the epistles, which are very consistent why they were commanded to be baptized in the book of Acts. And by the way, why Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. There's one truth. Baptism from the epistles also teaches us that it is when we put on Christ. Galatians, the third chapter in verses 26 and 27, the apostle Paul says, but now that faith has come, we're no longer under a tutor, verse 25. No longer one that's, uh, that's in charge of our, of our education. But now it has come. Now we're, we are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For as many of you as were baptized into Christ did put on Christ. Through the Spirit's teaching we learn that we need to come to Christ for salvation. When do we put on Christ? We put on Christ when we're baptized into Christ. And that's also when we were manifesting that we're sons of God by faith. See Colossians 2, 11 through 13, faith is involved in baptism. We must believe in the working of God who raised Jesus from the dead. If I didn't believe Jesus was raised from the dead by the power of God, why would I trust God the power to forgive me of my sins? The magic is not in the water. It's in the fact of what Jesus has done for you. And what it happens at baptism is when we were made sons of God by faith. That's when we put on Christ, not before. Not when I, at 13, I accepted Jesus as my savior. Wait till 16 to get baptized. Denominations are not teaching what we see here. And I haven't read a command yet to be baptized. It's really looking back at baptism for the Christian to teach them informative things. And I want us to learn these things too. It explains when we become sons of God by faith. And then the final area of investigation is 1 Peter 3.21. Because Peter speaks here about baptism as being a figure. And the moment we think of figure, we think of figurative, not real. And that's the wrong type of thinking in this verse. But if you were to leave out the parenthesis and just get to the root, the, the main thought, I think you could say it this way. In 1 Peter 3, 21, we'll read it. 
which also after a true likeness doth now save you even baptism, or a like figure, some translations have, doth now save you in baptism, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh, but an answer of a good conscience, or interrogation, good conscience, but, uh, but a good conscience toward God through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. A true likeness? Yeah, it's a true likeness, but it's figurative. That's what baptism is. It's a, it's a figurative sacrament. You're, you're, you're picturing the death and the resurrection of Christ, and, and it's, it's figurative. That doesn't mean it is real and essential to your salvation. In a figurative way, it saves us. But it's just something illustrating in a figurative way of what Jesus did for us on the cross and by his grace and through his resurrection here in this passage. So we need to understand, if we were to just take away everything, it's the figure that saves us by the resurrection of Christ. But what happens is that when we go from there, we begin to see what the, his big point in the figure was water. Because he says it is the like figure of something. Well, what it, well we put verse 20 with it. And he says that a four time, talking about the people that were four time disobedient, when the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved through water, which also, after a like figure, doth now save you even baptism. Water becomes the element again in saving baptism. But please note the first point. I didn't say it was because of water. That's the element. But it's the resurrection of Christ. He didn't say baptism is figurative here. He uses a special term to denote the true likeness. He's making a comparison with the waters in the days of Noah and the waters of baptism today. He said, well, water had to do with it. You know, they got killed because of water, not saved. It's the ark that saved them. Then Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be condemned. Because that's water. It would condemn every Baptist that ever lived. Because you're going to have to get in the water to be a Baptist. What is he saying about water? He said water is through the element through which they were saved. I got to get in my mind, there's a bunch of worldly people drowned in water. These were saved. It was the dividing line between a world of sin and salvation. He didn't say it, well, he says about the ark was preparing, but he says we're saved through water. That's the element. And that's exactly what baptism does. Through the element of water, because of the resurrection of Jesus Christ, and we may add a passage just a moment about the death of Christ, is that that antitype, it's something striking against something else that is more permanent. The waters, the, the waters of baptism, that's the, that, that, that's the permanent thing that saves us now. Something was striking against that in the antitupos. It was the waters of the flood. Water is the element to focus on, not the ark. Wherein eight souls were saved through water. That divided them from a world of sin, and baptism will divide you from a world of sin. We just saw that in Romans 6. The Bible's consistent with truth. And yet, why would you ever argue you believe in water regeneration? Like something magical in the water. I just said it's by the resurrection of Christ. That's what Peter says. It's not the taking away of the filth of the flesh. It's not taking a bath. But it's an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection. 
But it's where I add the blood of Christ in Hebrews 9 and verse 14. We'll find that Jesus gives his life and sheds his blood and offers himself to the eternal spirit without blemish unto God to cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. His death, his blood cleanses my guilt of sin and through his resurrection, I know I can be saved and baptism saves you today. To say baptism does not save is to contradict the Bible. We're putting water in its context. And it's a powerful point that we're speaking about water baptism, not Holy Spirit baptism. Baptism in the name of the Lord because it's his death and his resurrection is the foundation. And I haven't read a command yet to be baptized in these epistles. It's reflection time. And what we do, we learn a lot of truth by it. It's the peel of a good conscience toward God. You want to have a clean conscience this morning? You'll need to be baptized in the name of Christ. The element is water. And you can just remember, that was the dividing line between a world of sin and the flood and eight righteous souls. I want to be a righteous soul this morning. And I want to be saved by his blood and the confirmation of his resurrection gives me the confidence of that powerful working of God, that operation, I can be saved as well. So what do we have? What is the one baptism of Ephesians 4? Water is the element. It is in the name of the Lord knowing that it's authority for the basis of salvation and that authority is based upon what he did for us. He shed his blood. He died for us. He was raised for our justification, Romans 4.25. I'm being baptized with him into death. And I'm being raised with him into his death and cause of his resurrection and connected with that. It is when I die to sin, repent, but turn away from my sin. And I'm going to have the guilt of sin washed away. And now I'm going to be a servant of righteousness. See, that was the point of Romans 6. They thought they could keep on sinning. But as a baptized child of God, they just keep on sinning and getting more grace. God forbid, Paul says. You're dead to sin. You're repented of sin. You're baptized to have your sins washed away. Now you become a servant of righteousness. That's Paul's argument. He commanded to be baptized. That's, a, that's important. And they already, already were baptized. This is what it means. Now live it. In Colossians, the second chapter, you're raised with Christ. Now let's seek him where he is above, not the things upon this earth. He's driving the Christian to go back to the time in which they were definitive called children of God. I don't have to work. When was I saved? When you obey the gospel, you'll know exactly when you were saved. And the confidence is, is based upon the authority of Christ, not on water, not the preaching of a sermon, not how I felt about the time. It's God's way of making that definitive moment for you. And I ask you the question, is it essential? Well, if I didn't hear anything else, I just had Ephesians 4. I ask you, which element that is called one is not essential? One Lord. Is believing in one Lord essential? One faith. Is that essential that I find out what the one faith is? One hope of your calling. Can that be something else besides heaven? One Holy Spirit. Is there a bunch of spirits that, that are okay? One baptism. If those other ones are essential, why would you ever think that this one is not essential. It's a false doctrine, maybe well many people, but what I learned from the epistles is that water is the element, the name of the Lord is the authority behind it. It stands between me and salvation as a sinner. 
It's when we die to sin, and yes, it is essential unto salvation. That's why Jesus says, he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Why don't you follow Jesus, obey the gospel as we stand and as we sing.